The Swamp Thing series was resurrected in 1982 to coincide with the release of the Swamp Thing movie, written and directed by Wes Craven. Of course, DC hoped the movie would be a smash hit, like the previously released Superman movie. They also hoped a successful Swamp Thing movie would translate into an equally successful comic book series. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. The movie was a train wreck. But the relaunched Swamp Thing series did well enough that it wasn't immediately cancelled. The first 19 issues of that series, which were almost entirely written by Martin Pascoe and illustrated by Tom Yates, are highly overlooked and overshadowed by what followed once both creators left the series. For the most part, this is a solid run. However, it does get somewhat messy and convoluted in places. And, later in the series, it keeps restating the plot developments over and over to ensure the reader can follow what's going on. Admittedly, this was a standard practice for comic books, but these summaries took up a lot of space, sometimes as much as three or four pages of a 17-page story. That's quite significant. The first 13 issues amount to one continuous story. The plot revolves around a girl the Swamp Thing saves from being murdered by her father. As the series progresses, we learn the girl possesses supernatural power and she's actually the messiah for the Antichrist. With the help of an extensive supporting cast, Swamp Thing stops this girl from bringing about the apocalypse. The story begins quite strong and it's ambitious, but as it progresses and as more characters are introduced, it does get a bit messy. To be honest, some of the plot twists seem like the writer was stalling for time. It reads like he thought he had enough story for a year-long series, but then he discovered he had run dry about halfway through. Certainly, part of this can be attributed to the nature of serial storytelling. That being said, this story goes on a little longer than necessary. The following two issues are a fill-in story that are quite terrible. It may have been an inventory story that had been sitting around for years, and it was published because they had nothing else for the next two months. Moving on. Pasco returned for another three issues before deciding his schedule was too strained to continue. He left the series to focus on animation work rather than comic books. He was also joined by a new art team, Steve Bissett and John Tottleben. While the prior regular artist, Tom Yates, was good, Bissett and Tottleben were a perfect combination for a horror-related title. The addition of these two artists greatly enhanced Pasco's scripts. It was at this point the series began to dramatically change. To begin with, Matthew Cable and Abby Arcane are reintroduced, having been absent from the beginning. The intervening years between the last series and their reintroduction are explained, and the nature of their relationship is also established. They are now husband and wife, having been drawn together through shared trauma. The Sunderland Corporation, which had been established and explored through this series, takes a more active role in deciding Swamp Thing's future, meaning it's decided the Swamp Thing must die. Finally, and perhaps more importantly, Anton Arcane is brought back with a new batch of insect-based unmen. These three elements will be very important once the series changes hands with the 20th issue. While the preceding 16 issues had a minimal impact on the future of the comic, these three issues are definitely important. It may be the incoming writer, Alan Moore, had some input into these issues because there is a noticeable shift in tone. It is much darker and creepier, and the characters start to feel more alive. Again, part of this tonal difference is due to the art team, who seem to be able to translate beautifully grotesque imagery directly from their brains right onto the comic book page. It's an interesting transition. Of course, it's about to get even more interesting. Alan Moore took over writing Swamp Thing with issue number 20. At the time, he was an established British writer, having written extensively for 2000 AD. Marvel Man was just starting in Warrior Magazine and Captain Britain was nearing completion. But for the most part, Moore was unfamiliar to a North American audience. Moore's first issue was appropriately titled Loose Ends, as it ties up many prior dangling plot threads. It's an effort to clear the stage, so to speak. This is not much of a beginning, it's more of a brief transition from one writer to another and it works as a mission statement, with Moore announcing he will bring the monsters into the light and examine them. The following issue is where everything changes. Swamp Thing is literally torn apart, deconstructed, and given an entirely different basis for his origin. Then he is resurrected and given a new life, all within 24 pages. Much like Moore did with Marvel Man and Captain Britain, he acknowledges the character's history, accepts it, and integrates it into the direction he intends to explore. 
Additionally, he sets the tone and atmosphere for all that is about to follow, all within 24 pages. Len Wein, the creator of Swamp Thing and the editor for the beginning of Moore's run, described Moore's stories the best. A threat is established. The threat is brought to Swamp Thing's attention. Swamp Thing removes that threat. The important part of this insight is the notion that Swamp Thing only gets involved when the problem is big enough for him to notice. It indicates that he has evolved beyond the humanity he thought he possessed. His empathy and concern is reserved for all life, regardless of origin, rather than threats that are specific to humanity or one specific individual. There is, of course, the message of environmentalism within the work. For the most part, though, Moore keeps that message as obvious subtext, rather than preachy, outspoken dialogue that condescends to the audience. Early in the Swamp Thing run, following issue number 24, Len Wein stepped aside as editor and Karen Berger took his place. Berger, who would go on to be editor of all DC's oddball titles and would establish Vertigo Comics in 1993, was relatively new and had a perspective that hadn't been shaped by years of working within DC's corporate structure. This is significant because she would make a few tough decisions that would affect the course of the series. When Alan Moore was first hired as the Swamp Thing writer, the artists, Bissett and Toddlebin, sent him a list of story ideas they had submitted to the previous writer, Martin Pascoe. Pascoe had, essentially, dismissed all of these ideas. But Moore was open to ideas from the art team. More to the point, he used as many as he could. One such idea, The Autistic Child and The Monkey King, was incorporated into the two-part demon story. Another idea was one that would be published as the Nuke Face Papers. Originally, this story was intended to follow the demon story, but Berger decided this dour, nuclear waste story would kill the momentum the title was experiencing. So, she asked Moore to submit something different. Moore had little time to write a new story, but over the course of a few weeks, he managed to complete a story titled Love and Death. It was a story that spanned three issues and one annual. Later, Moore would state, this was the story that accidentally created the Vertigo Comics universe, and he's not entirely wrong. At the same time, he's not exactly right, either. Vertigo wouldn't exist for another decade, but the content he was creating did prove there was a market for this type of material. The work by Jamie Delano, Peter Milligan, Neil Gaiman, and Grant Morrison would also contribute to the foundation that would become Vertigo. Regardless, Love and Death is nearly sadistic in its treatment of Abby Arcane. She is abused and eventually murdered by her uncle, the recently resurrected Anton Arcane. The final page of that issue being one of the best heartbreaking moments in comics. This issue was unequivocally rejected by the comics code, and it doesn't take a lot of thought to figure out what they wouldn't approve. Abby is misled by her uncle into believing he's her husband, Matt Cable, which leads to a distasteful crime that cannot be mentioned on YouTube. Because the issue was complete and there was no time to create a replacement and a fill-in would kill the buzz the title was generating, Berger decided to print it without comics code approval. At the time, it was a very risky decision and could have harmed Berger's career in comics. But in the end, it turned out to be a wise move. The story was a massive success. While the following issue was code approved, the next issue was not, nor were any issues that followed. The strength of that story and the response from the audience allowed Berger the opportunity to stop submitting the title for code approval, which in turn allowed the creative team more freedom to explore darker and more mature themes. While Love and Death is not flawless, it is one of the best stories in the Swamp Thing run. Possibly, due to time constraints, Moore's text is very tight. It's very direct and to the point, unlike a lot of his forthcoming work, which has a tendency to overstate the atmosphere he's trying to establish. Results do vary depending on one's tastes. Love and Death is an example of a writer who has to get in and move the story forward with minimal tone, letting the art handle that chore. Certainly it makes for a brisk story, but it enhances the urgency of the situation. After all, Abby is dead, her body is starting to decay, and one can sit around for five issues wondering how to make things better. Events have to happen quickly and the situation has to be resolved, or Arcane will triumph. Following this story, Moore would find new directions for this character and expand upon the premise he had previously established. The next significant arc was called American Gothic. It kicked off with the two-part story, The Nuke Face Papers, and it went on to explore various modern motifs of the horror genre, such as werewolves, vampires, zombies, and serial killers, all of which have a particular unique spin to them. The werewolf is a female whose transformation is tied to her menstrual cycle. The vampires, from a prior Martin Pascoe story, are aquatic leeches, 
The zombies have returned to reenact the brutality of slavery. The serial killer is obsessed with numbers and is, ultimately, a faceless boogeyman. The point of these stories is to illustrate the nightmare behind the American dream and to show Swamp Thing that evil is escalating in the world. Swamp Thing's guide to horror is the newly created character John Constantine. Constantine is a charming manipulator who, for vague reasons, keeps his agenda hidden from Swamp Thing. In the end, Constantine is using Swamp Thing to save the universe from supernatural annihilation. It's worth mentioning that this storyline directly ties into and is a companion piece to Crisis on Infinite Earths. Basically, Crisis took place in the material world while this story took place in the spiritual plane. The most significant development in the Swamp Thing mythos is also revealed in this arc, the Parliament of Trees. This is, basically, a graveyard for all of the Earth elementals that have been active prior to the current Swamp Thing. These former elementals have come to one specific location, taken root, and have joined together as a collection of knowledge. Again, Moore incorporates Swamp Thing's continuity by having Swamp Thing talk to Alex Olsen, the Swamp Thing from the original story by Ween and Wrightson from House of Secrets number 92. Thus, he cleverly works in a long-standing continuity glitch. It's somewhat minor, but well done nonetheless. The overall point is that Alec Holland isn't the first Earth Elemental, nor will he likely be the last. It's also around this time that Alan Moore was preparing Watchmen while also preparing to continue the Marvel Man series for Eclipse. His attention is starting to wane, and his future aspirations don't include this muck-encrusted monstrosity. It seems apparent that he intended to leave Swamp Thing as soon as possible at the end of this story. After all, Swamp Thing saved the universe in American Gothic. It's hard to follow a story like that with something equally as dramatic. The stories that follow, until he concludes his run with issue number 64, are imaginative but somewhat uneven. There is a good handful of fill-in issues as well. At points, the artists, Rick Veach and Steve Bissett, took turns scripting the series. The issues that Moore does script are rather abstract, as he explores alien settings and situations. Critically speaking, these issues seem like a writer trying to find scenarios to keep himself interested. Depending on your taste, you'll either find these issues as beautiful, poetic mediations about the variety of life in the universe, or you'll find them to be somewhat bloated first drafts by a writer trying too hard to elevate the medium. It's hard not to notice the similarities between the ending of Swamp Thing and the ending of Miracle Man. Both characters have humble beginnings, a rise to a position of godlike power, and then create a kingdom for themselves to live within. For Miracle Man, this kingdom was the entire world. For Swamp Thing, it was his small location in Louisiana. Furthermore, both take time to brood about their purpose and their responsibility to that purpose. In the end, they take separate paths. Miracle Man gives everyone the power to be like gods, while Swamp Thing decides to sit in his kingdom and let the world spin on its axis. Thematically, they are essentially the same, but they arrive at different conclusions. Practically speaking, Swamp Thing was going to continue as a series once more left, so he had to leave the next writer something to work with. The influence of Alan Moore on the character cannot be overstated. He took Swamp Thing and developed him into a character with depth, and established a setting that allowed room for a lot of exploration. He incorporated a somewhat silly origin, gave it an internal logic, and then he added to the premise, expanding it into a modern mythology. For the writers that would follow him, Alan Moore left behind a willing but somewhat reluctant god, and a legacy that most would try to uphold or reinterpret. The writer that followed Alan Moore was Rick Veach. Veach had written a few fill-in issues during the Moore run, and had drawn most of the final Alan Moore arc. He was familiar with the character, so he seemed like a good choice to take over the series. More to the point, he was about the only person in the industry willing to follow the groundbreaking work done by Alan Moore. Veach's run between issues 65 and 87 expand upon the consequences of Swamp Thing being ejected from Earth and wandering the galaxy. While the Swamp Thing was absent, the Parliament of Trees began the process of calling forth another Earth Elemental to replace him. Swamp Thing's return means there will be two Earth Elementals, and that's apparently against the rules. So, Swamp Thing is put in the position to either kill this replacement, or find a solution that doesn't involve murder. Of course, Swamp Thing isn't good with murdering an infant version of himself, and that puts him at odds with the Parliament of Trees. The solution to the problem is very Veach. Swamp Thing possesses John Constantine, uses his body to impregnate Abby, and then he places the baby elemental spirit into Abby's womb, 
Thus, Abby will eventually give birth to an Earth elemental human hybrid. As it turns out, this was the end result the Parliament of Trees was looking for all along. It's a bit convoluted, and the logic is a bit shaky, but it's reasonably good nonetheless. As a transition from one writer to another, it's quite seamless. There's a huge tonal difference though. Veach dips into the absurd and satirizes pop culture, as opposed to exposing the modern horror of existence. Veach's run is also one continuous arc. Structurally, it's like a more traditional comic book. It reads like an ongoing title without an end, rather than a series of related stories with definitive conclusions that build to one final resolution. Unfortunately, the Veach run came to a sudden, messy conclusion. Swamp Thing at this point was still a part of the regular DC universe, and, at that time, an event called Invasion was gearing up. For some reason, the invading aliens in that series used wood technology. This presented an immediate problem. With Swamp Thing's abilities, an invasion of that nature would begin and end in about 15 seconds. So, Swamp Thing had to be taken out of play within the DC Universe. Veach's solution was to have the invading aliens disrupt Swamp Thing's aura and, well, look, it doesn't make much sense. One can definitely get what Veach was going for though. It's a fantastical explanation, like one finds in Star Trek. Trek writers throw in a bunch of techno babble to make the warp drive failing sound grounded in reality when, really, it's just a bunch of nonsense words that don't actually mean anything. Well, that's basically what happens in Swamp Thing. A lot of esoteric, sciencey sounding things happen, and that plunges Swamp Thing back in time. From there, Swamp Thing encounters characters like Sergeant Rock, Enemy Ace, and Tomahawk as he falls backwards in time. During this arc, Veach intended Swamp Thing to meet Jesus Christ, on the cross no less. Veach submitted a detailed plot, then a full script for approval. Both were accepted, and the issue was completely penciled and partially inked before DC decided they were not going to publish the story. This sudden change of heart seems to be based on the negative reaction to the recent movie The Last Temptation of Christ. Due to this controversy, DC changed their mind about the story, so they pulled the issue and asked Veach for something else. As one might expect, Veach was displeased. He immediately quit the title. The writer that was supposed to follow Veach once the time travel story concluded withdrew his story submission as a sign of solidarity. That writer was Neil Gaiman, who had just begun writing Sandman. The writer that had the unfortunate task of finishing Rick Veach's time traveling story was Doug Wheeler. Presumably, Wheeler had an outline to work from since much of what he wrote followed what Veach intended to do. Still, for any writer, it can't be an easy task to take over a story that's mostly complete and then bring it to a satisfying conclusion. Doing so doesn't leave a lot of room to make your own mark, since one is trying to interpret the intentions of another writer. The end result was awkward and slightly confusing. At the end of the time-traveling journey, Swamp Thing creates the Parliament of Trees and then somehow manages to travel forward in time to the moment of the birth of his child, Tefe. Honestly, it's not clear how this was accomplished and it may be reasonable to speculate that Wheeler didn't know either. Wheeler started off in a bad place, and he never really found his footing. He wrote the series from issues 88 to 109, which is a fairly significant run, but he didn't add anything to the series that was worthwhile. He did write The Birth of Tefe, but that was set up previously by Veach. Following that, he had Swamp Thing return to Hell, yet again, to recover the soul of a loved one, yet again. Then he set up a war between the green elementals and the virus-like grey elementals, which was a story that felt a lot longer than it actually was. Overall, the stories were small. The comic steered away from horror and explored mostly straightforward conflicts. Swamp Thing was basically a god, but Wheeler never managed to come up with believable situations that challenged the character or exploited the vulnerabilities of the character. To be fair, Wheeler also had a team of artists that never really suited the series, the exception being Kelly Jones, who stepped in for one filler issue. So, unfortunately, for the few years Wheeler worked on the series, it looked and felt competent, but it wasn't overly interesting. The series began to shed readers during Doug Wheeler's run, and it was on the verge of being cancelled. Editorial decided the series needed a strong horror element to revive the comic book and prevent its cancellation. So, horror writers were approached and asked to pitch stories and a direction for the character. Editorial decided on Nancy A. Collins, an author best known for the novel Sunglasses After Dark, 
she officially took over Swamp Thing with the sixth annual and began a lengthy run on the title from issues 110 to 138. Collins immediately set the tone and location, making it obvious the series was going to explore grotesque horror and remain, for the most part, in the Louisiana area. She also incorporated the folklore of the area into the series, giving it a distinct Cajun flavor. Her first year on the series was spent establishing the Swamp Thing family unit, while Swamp Thing occasionally took care of threats in the immediate area. However, at the beginning of Colin's second year, she was asked by editorial to change things up. Swamp Thing hanging out with his family in a swamp was quickly becoming tiresome, so Collins was asked to break up the marriage between Swamp Thing and Abby, and then get the character to a place where he was on his own once again. Killing both Abby and Tefe was suggested as an option, but Collins, who had put a lot of work into both characters, decided she was not going to kill the two most significant female characters in the series. Instead, Collins introduced Lady Jane, an elemental assigned to care for Tefe, and she introduced a completely forgettable human male, Don Reynard. Both characters were temptations for both Swamp Thing and Abby, respectively. What followed was a slightly predictable melodrama between Swamp Thing and Abby that, quite honestly, felt more than a little forced. However, by the time Colin had completed her second and final year, Swamp Thing and Abby went their separate ways, and Tefe was taken by Lady Jane to be raised by the Parliament of Trees. Swamp Thing was once again on his own. During her time on the title, Collins re-established the Sunderland Corporation, now controlled by the daughter, Connie Sunderland. She also brought back Anton Arcane. Both subplots collide, merge together, and eventually present a reasonable challenge to Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing also got an updated, early 90s grunge look. Thankfully, this attempt to appeal to disgruntled teen spirits didn't last long. For the most part, Collins' run on the title was not outstanding, but it was solid. It was respectful to the character and cohesive overall. Collins found a niche to explore and the title comfortably stayed there. This approach was successful and the sales did increase for Swamp Thing, which saved it from cancellation. Following a completely forgettable fill-in issue, Mark Miller took over Swamp Thing with issue 140. He would write the series until it was cancelled with issue 171. Actually, the opening story arc was co-written with Grant Morrison, but Miller would allegedly work solo for the remainder of the series. Although, according to Morrison, they assisted or ghostwrote a fair amount of Miller's material until the early 2000s. Now, I am in the position to admit that Mark Miller's work doesn't appeal to me whatsoever. Therefore, my objectivity during this segment is questionable. My bias now established, let's move on. During this run of Swamp Thing, one can track Miller's progress from a writer establishing himself into the successful writer he is today. His edgy writing tendencies begin toned down, but they fully bloom later in the series. Miller's entire run on the series was dedicated to getting Swamp Thing to a point where he no longer had any humanity. This would, in turn, cause him to destroy all life on the planet. Along the way he meets with, and is granted power by, the Parliaments of Stones, waves, vapors, and flames. With all this power at his command, he is granted access to the Parliament of Worlds. With this ultimate power unlocked, Swamp Thing suddenly decides not to destroy the Earth after all. In all fairness, one has to make allowances for the somewhat abrupt epiphany at the end due to the fact that the title had been cancelled. Miller might not have had the time to do anything but a quick reset. On paper, this is a decent plot with some interesting potential to explore. Instead, it's a deeply flawed piece of work that lacks any sense of logic if one spends any time thinking about it. Admittedly, Miller does make the same presumption many prior writers made when approaching the concept, namely, that the parliaments of the Earth desire to wipe out humanity. Alan Moore had established a reasonable explanation why this hadn't and wouldn't occur. While humanity is doing a good job at destroying the environment, it's also a necessary presence on the planet. Basically, humanity is an essential part of the ecosystem. More to the point, the Swamp Thing was there to keep humanity in check and to prevent them from getting to the point where extermination was necessary. He is an ambassador, not a weapon. Naturally, it's more interesting to the audience if Swamp Thing is a weapon. That's basic narrative conflict. So it's understandable why a writer would choose that path over the other. Also, environmentalism was a huge talking point in the 90s. So, having Swamp Thing, an Earth Elemental, be the avatar of vengeance played into the general bias that nature itself was angry at humanity 
Instead of picking apart Miller's entire run, let's settle on a few examples of the flaws. In the second arc, River Run, Swamp Thing encounters a dead woman who needs him to enter the short stories she has written and then bring them all to a satisfying conclusion. It's an interesting conceptual premise. However, Miller completely skips over how Swamp Thing makes himself fictional and then inserts himself as an active element in a story that's already been written. There is the vague suggestion that these stories occur on alternate worlds, but that still doesn't explain how Swamp Thing crosses from one universe to another. It happens simply because Miller needs it to happen. As another brief example of this same flaw, there is a shadowy group of men that are allegedly manipulating Swamp Thing into being a destroyer of worlds. But Miller never illustrates these men doing anything other than have them say that's exactly what they're doing. This flaw is prevalent in the series and in much of Miller's work. He doesn't show, he tells. I'm going to stop at two examples. As stated earlier, I am predisposed to see these flaws, so there's no critical value in continuing. Sales of the series were once again in decline during Miller's tenure on the title. However, this was likely due to the comic book market imploding, rather than the quality of the stories he wrote. So, in late 1996, after 171 consecutive issues, the Swamp Thing series was cancelled once again. Despite announcing in the letter column that there were plans for Swamp Thing following the end of the series, the character would actually lay dormant until 2004. Swamp Thing did make cameo appearances at the funerals for Hal Jordan and Jim Corrigan, and he guest starred in Aquaman and Hellblazer, but that was about it. It's worth mentioning these appearances because all of the changes Miller had made to the character were completely ignored. Swamp Thing was a representative of the Green, not the champion of all the various parliaments of the Earth. It wouldn't be until the 2004 series that these changes would be addressed. In the year 2000, the Swamp Thing series was resurrected again, sort of. This time it focused entirely on the adventures of Swamp Thing and Abby Holland's daughter, Tefe. In other words, using the Swamp Thing name for the series was an obvious attempt to attract an audience familiar with the character, even though it had almost nothing to do with Swamp Thing. The series would only last 20 issues. Notably, it was entirely written by Brian K. Vaughn, a writer who would go on to write more successful titles like Why the Last Man, Runaways, and more recently, Saga. For the most part, this is rather forgettable material. It's not terrible, but it certainly isn't up to the standard Vaughn would be known for later in his career. If one is familiar with his work, and they were given an early issue without the credits page, one would likely not say it was Brian K. Vaughn's work. It really is that different. The series follows Tefe Holland as she wanders the continent trying to find a purpose. It explores her ability to control both plants and flesh, and what it's like to be a teen girl with immense power and responsibility, but having no guidelines concerning what to do with that power. So Tefe wanders, and honestly, gets very little insight into herself or how the world works. The series does acknowledge and incorporate Tefe's past, such as being given to the Parliament of Trees as a child. It doesn't get too caught up on prior continuity though. When the Swamp Thing shows up near the end of the series, he has given up the power previously given to him, and now he only works for the Green. This development will be completely ignored in the next ongoing series. Andy Diggle, who had previously rebooted The Losers for Vertigo, stepped in for a six-issue arc to do the same for Swamp Thing. Putting aside the prior Tefe Holland title, it had been eight years since the last solo Swamp Thing series. This six-issue introductory arc was an attempt to clear the stage and to undo all the changes that had been done to Swamp Thing over the years. The character was overpowered and inhuman, and as such, wasn't relatable to the mere mortals reading the comic. Diggle acknowledged and incorporated everything Mark Miller had established and basically ignored the Tefe Holland solo series. The basic premise is, Swamp Thing needs the humanity of Alec Holland restored. This restoration will balance the character out, depower him, and in essence, turn him into the muck-encrusted monstrosity everyone knows. Swamp Thing's focus is on his daughter, Tefe, who contains the final power he needs to become the supreme and only power on the planet. Once he acquires this power, he will destroy all life. This echoes the conclusion of the Mark Miller run, but it ignores the fact that this plot point had already been addressed. The story, as well written as it may be, doesn't make any logical sense. As established by Alan Moore, Alec Holland was never the Swamp Thing, 
He was a plant that had the consciousness of Alec Holland imprinted on it. Holland was the template, so to speak, but Swamp Thing was a unique personality that had, for a brief time, believed it was a human being trapped inside a plant body. The actual Alec Holland died, ended up in the afterlife, and hung out there until he was necessary for the plot. Holland wasn't an actual participant in any of the Swamp Thing's adventures. However, the Alec Holland that is put into Swamp Thing has knowledge of the creature's past and believes he was once this creature. And this Alec Holland states that Tefe is his actual daughter. None of this is true or possible. In fact, it contradicts everything previously established by Alan Moore and all the writers that followed him. Yes, this is being a nitpicky continuity nerd. But this reboot is utilizing continuity for its own purposes, so major contradictions do stand out. With that said, it is a well-written reboot. Diggle does set up a reasonable series of events that lead to a mostly satisfying conclusion if one can overlook the major logical flaw. These six issues do what needed to be done, namely to erase all the changes done to Swamp Thing and to allow the character an opportunity for more stories. To that degree, it is quite successful. Joshua Dicehart took over the Swamp Thing series following Andy Diggle's reboot and he would write it until the series concluded with the 29th issue. These are reasonably competent horror stories that are greatly enhanced by the artwork. Unfortunately, not a lot happens that is memorable. Dicehart spends the entirety of his run exploring what's called the Holland Mind. This is the essence of Alec Holland that, allegedly, tempers Swamp Thing. There is also an examination of both Alec and Linda Holland in the years prior to the accident that created Swamp Thing. For the most part, Dysart does a good job incorporating the Cajun elements from the Nancy A. Collins run and the horror-based themes from the Ellen Moore run. At the same time, he spends a significant amount of time exploring Alec Holland's past through flashbacks. In the end though, there's just something missing, and it's something that's not easily defined. Admittedly, there are a reasonable amount of good elements, and the artwork is perfectly suited to the material, but it's boring, to be honest. Perhaps this portion of the series is indicative of the hole the character had found himself in for many years. Everyone that followed Alan Moore wanted to add something new and better to the concept first, then find stories to tell with that new and improved concept. All of these additions made the character overly convoluted. The overall flaw is putting too much emphasis on the mythology. Too much time was spent defining the characteristics of the character rather than providing challenges that would reveal the characteristics in an organic manner. Over time, what writers had left to define became very granular and not very interesting to explore. Following the conclusion of this series, this version of Swamp Thing would be retired for all intents and purposes. As an imprint, Vertigo was struggling. This resulted in prior DC characters, such as Animal Man, John Constantine, and Swamp Thing, being reclaimed and added to the mainstream DC continuity once again. So, the era that began when Alan Moore changed the character forever, came to a close. Thanks to all the fine members that directly support this channel. And, if you've made it this far in the video, why not subscribe, or become a member? I try not to be an annoying pitchman, like Funky Flashman or something. But this channel needs support. A lot of support. So if you like what you see, then click a few links below this video and help out. Every subscription, membership, or donation is greatly appreciated. Not to mention, it makes the mythical YouTube algorithm notice this channel, which for some reason, it seems to avoid recommending. Okay, that's enough from me. I made my pitch. Thank you for watching. I'll talk at you later. Until next time.